So I'd li just like to start out um, remembering Professor Noel Keene, professor of plant pathology here, the fellow that introduced me to science back when I was in high school, became my mentor, hired me when I came to school here, and just a, a great scientist uh, who passed away a decade or more ago here. So I'm gonna cover three core themes, innovation, equity, and rates of change. I think it's going to uh, harmonize well with what Timothy told us. So innovation, everybody pretty much gets why it's important. I think one thing that's underestimated is just how important it has been and how important it's going to be in the future. A great book that gives very quantitative history of innovation from an energy point of view was published last year by Vaslav Smil. And he looks at energy as the currency of counting innovation. And I've used the Jonathan Swift quote here to tie it to agriculture. Oops. So you don't have to read all of this, but one of the most important inputs in agriculture is water. And Smill looks at, oops, yeah, I don't know how to, he looks at the um, return on investment, energy in, energy out, in the innovations around irrigation and finds that if you count all the cost of labor to raise water to irrigate wheat in um, early, early times, that the return on energy investment is about 30-fold. If you could get this in your IRA or your bank account, you'd be overjoyed. But irrigating wheat under these conditions gave a 30 to 1 energy return investment, the food energy for the labor of people and animals to lift the water, the extra food harvested. If we look at fertilizer, the returns are even higher. Here using manure, which is all that was available in those days, and counting the energy to put that, for, that manure on the field, the returns were 70 to one. Both the, f the fertilizer and the water use uh, efficiencies gained steadily due to innovations in things as mundane as harnesses. The type of harness on a horse or oxen made a huge difference in the animal's energy conversion either to water lifting or plowing uh, uh, or hauling. Same with um, the plows themselves. Uh, plow technology went through many generations and Smill's book gives lots of examples. If we look at um, the total energy return of wheat farming at the, at the, you know, 200 AD, he estimates the energy in and the energy out was 23 to one. So agriculture is a huge return on investment. A thousand years later in England, that energy return had almost doubled in um, a millennia. In the next 600 years, it quadrupled. And the rate of change of this um, efficiencies have actually then accelerated in more recent times. So this shows centuries of very slow rates of change, in this case measured as productivity of the land, with an inflection beginning after the Renaissance, and particularly around the 17 and 1800s. It varied in different uh, countries depending on the environment and the economic demands. 
But if we go to then the last 200 years, this is probably the world's longest term experiment in the field. Uh, Broadbulk at Rothamsted in the UK going back to the 1850s. There's a couple key points here. The first is that um, without fertilizer, in this case it would have been manure, uh, you were below, you were about a ton per hectare of wheat. With fertilizer, there was more than a doubling, and this explains the, the great return on investment for uh, fertilizer use. The astonishing thing here is that this land with no fertilizer added for 150 years is still yielding about a ton per hectare. So how is this possible? The reason is there are natural sources of nitrogen that keep replenishing the field, but it never goes up. I was wondering what this little dip here was with and without the fertilizer. This is World War I, where they couldn't afford the labor to weed. And so weeds got in both with and without fertilizer and gave this dip. Then you see in the last half of the last century, a sudden uptick in uh, innovations in wheat breeding and wheat management to the point where now it's gone from a um, long time ago below a ton per hectare to now it's possible to grow 12 tons per hectare. That doesn't mean it's always done, but that's what's possible. The single biggest jump here came with the Green Revolution genetics, the short stature wheats that could put more of their energy into the head and less into the stalk. The other big point here, and this is very relevant to development, is this point with no fertilizer actually has everything else. It has the modern varieties, it has the herbicides, it has the fungicides. Uh, it has everything except it's never seen fertilizer, which means if you don't pay attention to soil fertility, Timothy's quest to raise land productivity is not gonna be possible. If we look at another one of Smill's books, Enriching the Earth, he looks at soil fertility and the sources very quantitatively. And while we talk a lot about manure, historically, it's a recycled source. So manure is not a source of new ammonia or nitrate or reduced nitrogen. It's a recycled source. And also, as Timothy pointed out, every turn of that cycle is downward spiral. So you manure, you grow, you feed the animals, you, add, you bring the manure mat back. You bring back half or less of the nitrogen than you had to start with. And if there's not fresh ammonia or reduced nitrogen brought in, you never, uh, uh, you're eventually gonna run out. So the sources of new are lightning, which strips the and triple bond apart in the air and rains ammonia on the land, the microbes and used by legumes, and then Haber-Bosch the chemical process. So here's the good news. The good news is innovation has made the energy efficiency of ammonia synthesis really, really efficient. Here's the bad news. The laws of thermodynamics mean we can't make it much better, which is why chemical or fertilizer companies don't invest in R&D on the efficiency of synthesis, because there's no headroom left. But the good news is more than half of what's applied is wasted. And so these technologies to increase the efficiency of use uh, um, are where there's still a lot of headroom for breakthroughs. I'm gonna skip this for lack of time. And let me tell you, anybody that wants the presentation and the book references, you can have the whole thing. Um, the consequences of the innovation are documented really well. This is my favorite book, The Great Escape, by the Nobel uh, winning economist Angus Deaton. And he talks about how a lot of us have escaped from our common state uh, of poverty 
based on first and foremost innovation, but also different forms of equity that have allowed more than just the lucky few to benefit from the innovations. And this is the second theme I want to bridge to, is how and why equity is a major driver, not just an outcome. A book I'll recommend that goes into some of the underpinnings for this is Poor Economics. Uh, one of the key conclusions of this book by Banerjee and Duflo is that there is not a poverty trap. In other words, people do not stay poor because they start poor. And what these authors show is that very poor people can make progress with very little incremental changes. And the definition of a poverty trap would be if you're very poor, you cannot make progress. What they show, and this is a rather subtle argument, is that being poor doesn't keep you poor. There's something else that keeps you poor. And the, the biggest outcome from this is their analysis of the microfinance revolution, which gives a little bit of money to poor people, lets them make a little bit of benefit, and it shows quantitatively over time that it's largely failed to bring people out of poverty. Because, not because there wasn't a benefit to the little bit of help, but because something else is holding people back. And we'll call that a structural inequality or inequity that um, pulls people back into poverty even though there is a ladder that otherwise could let them climb out. And this is where we come to agriculture. Going back to uh, uh, the 150 years ago, this book talks about how the first commissioner of agriculture for the US was hired by Japan to lead its development by modernizing agriculture. This book talks about how Japan recovered after World War II. And this is something almost nobody knows, but Japan's post-war recovery was founded on agricultural development. And it was founded on agricultural development with a structural equity feature that General MacArthur imposed at the recommendation of Wolf Landajinsky. The land formerly owned by a few big landowners who extracted rents from peasant farmers, never allowing them to get out of poverty because the more progress they made, the more rents were extracted from them, was redistributed uniformly, equitably, with a three hectare limit uh, across all of the farmlands of Japan. A very communist thing for uh, a US general to do in the days of McCarthyism, despite, he, he was MacArthur. <laughs> but the book shows how and why this structural equity adjustment made all the difference to Japan's ability to launch. And it explains how small-scale agriculture is the basis, essentially, for all agriculture, or all economic development and poverty reduction um, in the world. An even more in-depth treatise, and I've got one copy that I'll leave behind. You'll have to figure out who wins the, the, the the prize, compares African and, and, and in, uh, Southeast Asian countries' development over time. And it, it provides some very interesting insights. So this is the per capita change of Malaysia and Kenya from 1950. And you can see they both started equally poor. But something happened a vast divergence. And the author of this book, 
explains what the countries did different to give these vastly different outcomes. The uh, Malaysia back in the day would be something our current president might have called a SH country. Here's all of Southeast Asia and all of Sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see they, South Asia as a whole was actually worse off back in 1960 and has diverged tremendously as a group. If we look at Indonesia in particular, ag productivity done in an equitable way was actually the basis for this divergence. And here we can see rice going from less than two to over five tons per hectare. This productivity correlates and the time lags demonstrate it's a causative agent, not a responsive agent. If we look at, in this case, corn in Kenya, it's essentially flat for 50 years. This is just, just lack of attention to development. All the technologies are there to uh, do five times better than this, but Kenya has largely ignored it. I want to talk, how much time have I got left? Uh, 10 minutes, okay. I want to diverge a little into the concept of equity. And it turns out it's not a synonym for equality. In fact, it's very different from equality. Laws, when they were first developed, right, were based more on equality. That justice was blind, the same rule applied to everybody the same way. And what was noticed, particularly in the British justice system in the 17 and 1800s, was that this did not give outcomes that felt good, that seemed fair or just. And so a separate court system developed in Britain called the equity courts. And they applied justice according to a fairness doctrine that was separate from mechanical application of rules. This, this uh, system of law was enshrined. They had equity courts that would rule separately from the legal courts where the legal imposition wasn't wasn't giving a just outcome. Then over the last century, the two courts, the law courts and the equity courts were combined in the attempt that we actually have a hybrid system that does both follow the letter of the law but provide the mechanisms for equitable justice and relief. The land redistribution, the agricultural development policies are an application of equity that pays special attention to poor small farmers because it gives a more just outcome. And the, the beauty of the result here, well, this is, this, is, um, this is Henley's comparison of what was done in Southeast Asia and what was done in Sub-Saharan Africa. Africa largely has followed uh, a modern strategy to be transformative, to become rich, to modernize, to focus on knowledge, but it tends then to be elitist and it's oriented towards the outcome they want to become industrialized. Southeast Asia took a sim seemingly a uh, simple-minded approach, very incremental. Let's lot of, help a lot of people do a little bit better and let's do it fast. They started with the problem in mind, not the end point. They started with the beginning in mind. We want a lot of poor people to become richer. They focused on the driver, growth. They focused on the driver of growth, productivity. They were inclusive, this is the, the equity portion of this. And they were um, 
oriented towards the undesirable starting point, mass poverty, not the desired end point of industrialization. And the beauty of this, and all these books show this, when you start with the beginning in mind, it's much easier to get to the long end point than if you start with the end point in mind. And Africa has routinely made this mistake over and over again. That agriculture drove it is, and I've had this argument with some very famous economists. When I show them the data, they change their tunes. Uh, mass poverty in Indonesia started going down before 1970, and it was beginning to plateau because there weren't enough poor people left for rapid progress by 1982, which is when exports started. So 1982, there was almost no exports. It was just beginning. But by 1982, poverty had come down threefold to under 20% in Indonesia. Agriculture is what drove it. And then it allowed them to move on to uh, become more industrialized. Now, the, the most comprehensive explanation of all just came out last year. This book by John Miller it has a very simple recipe, like Timothy had. This has only got three parts, not five. 10% investment in agricultural development, driving 6% growth across the whole country in an equitable, inclusive way, gives rapid poverty reduction and rapid economic growth. And here I'll transition to the final point, the rates of change. The 6% ag growth is, works because it's 3% higher than population growth. So if you have slow population growth, you don't need to drive agriculture as hard to get the impact. And this was shown in uh, Indonesia, where they adopted a lot of the policies, educate girls, uh, make family planning available, and save children's infants' lives. And they drove their uh, population growth rate way down. Nigeria hasn't. If we look at here the divergence in uh, GDP per capita, Indonesia starting worse has now far outstripped Nigeria. And the author makes the argument that doing both ag development and uh, population, um, paying attention to population growth rates gives a synergistic double benefit. We go back to ag production in Africa. This is meat production. That was some of the bad news Timothy showed. In primary crops, this is, you gotta multiply by 100. So this is 200 million. This is 600 million tons of uh, primary crops. So it's like way off the scale compared to the meat. It looks like Africa's made a huge amount of progress in the last 50 years. The problem is this growth rate is exactly the same growth rate as population. And so the per capita food production, if anything, in 50 years has gone down. The rate of population growth has been faster than the rate of food production growth. And so they're actually worse off now than they were 50 years ago. I want to close with a couple of other rates of change stories. This is um, Eastern Africa maize yields, and they have been rising extremely slowly. It's 17 kilograms per hectare per year. These are Iowa maize yields. They've been going up at 126 kilograms per hectare per year. A couple of key interesting points here. This blip down in Iowa yields was uh, 2015. It was the drought of 2015, which in geologic terms is about as bad of, as any drought they've had in the last century. But if you come this way on that yield curve, 
you find that the worst year in the last 20 is better than the best year uh, in the in the uh, 100 years prior to that so this is this is good news we have both tremendous progress and a reduction in the effect of the downsides. And this is a combination of both the productivity and the resilience uh, of, of the crops doing that. The good news here is that Africa uh, has a lot of headroom to improve and do better. One country has followed this recipe for the last 15 years, Ethiopia. They've applied the Asian models, which were European and US models before that, and they've gotten the same result. So here are the yield trends in Ethiopian and Tanzanian maize. Up until 2002, when Ethiopia started their ag development, and they followed the invest broadly across the whole country in the smallholder farmers equitably uh, formula. And it's driven their productivity steadily up to the point where last year they actually superseded India's um, average productivity. And I don't have the graph, but if you look at their poverty rate, during this time frame, they've cut their poverty rate by more than half. Their whole economy is now booming. I think I'm out of time. There's a few other books we could talk about later, but I'll just close with Innovation matters, it's mattered hugely in the past, and there's a huge opportunity in the future. Equity is not just a goal or a moral value, it's actually a structural element in making progress that works with innovation in a way to give much better outcomes, and we really need to focus on the rates of change as Timothy pointed out, to make sure we both meet people's needs and do it sustainably. Thank you.